You know how in free market, free enterprise, Elon buys X, Matt Taibbi, Barry Weiss, all these guys, there's a whole crew of them, Twitter files, wow. Biden administration talking to YouTube, Google, take this guy, suspend this guy. Yeah, yeah. Twitter, hey, you guys going to, and then Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, you know, doesn't. Can can Trump if he gets elected? See, he wins next Tuesday. He wins. Oh, let's hope. Yeah, he let's wins. Hope. Can he assign folks to go do FBI files, CIA files, to go do DOJ files, Fauci files, CDC files, and would America benefit from someone actually exposing the level of corruption that some of these officials had? talking to these different social media companies, but I'm talking government communication with them, not the other way around. Because in order for us to find out, we would have to buy Google. There's nobody that can afford to buy Google right now. It's a trillion dollars, yeah. trillion and a half. You would have to buy Facebook. You would have to buy these guys. But flip it. If we yeah. assign people to go that route, can you get to the bottom of it? Yeah, I think you can. And we've done some of that. Uh, for example, you mentioned, um, I always use this example because it's the most most sort of prominent one. And it was an email on the third day of the Biden administration. So I think it was January 22nd, 23rd. Uh, there's an email from Clark Humphrey in the executive office of the, of the president, the White House, um, an email to Twitter. And the email says, take down this tweet ASAP. And the tweet was from RFK Jr. And the tweet was, if you remember when, uh, you, we were talking earlier, you love baseball, uh, when Hank Aaron passed away, RFK Jr. did a tweet. He said, uh, Hank Aaron passed away after taking the COVID shot. He took the shot to encourage black Americans to get vaccinated. So what's that? Three sentences. Every single one of those sentences is accurate. Every sentence is true. He took the shot. He passed away after the shot. And he, did, he was doing so to encourage black Americans to get vaccinated. And uh, they, the Biden, Biden-Harris administration wanted that, that, wanted that taken down. And I'm like, it's a true state. There's all true statements. But that is the that is the level of censorship. So we've been able to expose some of that, but certainly if President Trump gets in, he can because we've subpoenaed and it's all that it's always a fight with this agency, that agency, whether it's the FBI, CISA, the White House, whatever. We even brought in some of these people, we depose them, we have them in hearings. We do all that. And then we put out the reports that lay out the facts. But uh, certainly President Trump gets in, you get a new you're gonna get a new FBI director, you're gonna get a new attorney general. And they can dig into stuff with the Justice Department. You're going to get a new person running Department of Homeland Security. They can dig into any information there. But you can look at what, what kind of communication was going from the government to these big tech companies. Is, is, a, is, a, is Swamp a real thing? Okay. So how easy is it to, like, how easy is it within FBI, within DOJ, within CIA, within all these institutions to identify who the swamps are? Well, it starts at the top. I actually, I actually think um, we'll use the FBI as an example. I think the vast majority of the agents are good people. We have two former agents who work for the committee. They're, I mean, they're great guys. They're right out of central casting, Irish name, Italian name from Pittsburgh and Cleveland. They're just, you know, just good guys who help us as we're looking at them. They tell us, here's how they mm-hmm. would do, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. been really, I think the agents are great people, but it's the people at top. It's the people in D.C. that are the problem. If you go back to... Um, so go back to the whole spine on Trump's campaign back in 16 when it was, you know, Strzok and Page and, and, and all the Klein Smith, the lawyer for the FBI who lies to the FISA court, changes an email, turns it around 180 degrees to get the warrant to go spy on folks associated with President Trump's camp, campaign. That's the problem. These, were, these weren't like agents who came up through the streets in Pittsburgh and Cleveland and New York and, and, and you know, Rose. These were like lawyers who were working in D.C. for the FBI. And uh, you saw the bias and the—, and the the disdain they had. Remember the one email from uh, uh, Peter Strzok to Lisa Page. He's he's in the Walmart in, in Virginia, and he's and he's he's in the Northern Virginia. And he says, "I can smell the Trump supporters." You know, it's like the disdain they have for us. You know, country folk like me from from Ohio and folks across the heartland and everything else. So, um, yeah, there's there's there's. Who can Trump fire? Who can every, he not fire? I, I've encouraged, and I've said this to the press, but I, I believe it. Come in, fire everyone you're allowed to fire. And then, frankly, fire a few people you're not allowed to fire. Make them take you to court to send a message like there is a new sheriff back in town. No and shit. we're going to make this agency, we're going to make this government work for the people. And then the, the, real, the real thing he's looking to do is put Elon in charge of making the government a little more efficient, for goodness sake. Which, uh, so I think that is, that is the attitude that I think his team has. 
Um, certainly the attitude I think the president has. So when you say come in and fire everybody, and some you're not supposed to fire. So what's the number? You just said earlier 12,000 people in the history of America have been members of Congress. It's a very elite organization. It's very honorable to have be one of 12,000. hasn't happened that many times, and God knows how many people have lived in the U.S. since 1776. Yeah. What is that number of how many people to fire, to clean house? Well, there are certain people, you know, uh, historically, of course, you come in, I'll, we'll use the Justice Department since, you know, we're on the Judiciary Committee. Um, you fire all the U.S. attorneys, just like there's, I think, oh, I forget what the number, 100, I forget the number of U.S. attorneys in the districts around the country. You fire all them. Uh, I think you come in and get rid of the FBI director. You come in and get rid of, obviously, you're going to, the cabinet's going to be new. But there's a, there's a level of people at the top of these agencies that are political appointments. I would, I would like, you got to get rid of all that, I think. And then if there's some level below where you want to like this person, maybe they need to go too. Um, and, and just again, to demonstrate, demonstrate we're going to make the, the agencies not be weaponized against the American people, but actually serve we the people who pay their salaries, who pay the taxes. That's, that's supposed to be how the government operates. How do you filter out the swamp though? How do you know who's swamp? How do you know who's swamp? Um, I, it's all about leadership at the agency. It'll take a while to figure it out. Um, what are signs? Like if I, if I, if I were to, because remember, like he talked about it the first time he came around, he didn't know anybody in DC. So yeah. just kind of hiring people left and right. You know, nowadays there's rumors circulating who he's going to hire as his chief of staff. That's going to help him with all the other people yeah. and all these names that we're hearing about. But how do you identify who's swamp? I think, I think it's, I think it's like any organization you have to have leadership matters. So, okay, if, if I, I, you got to pick the guy who's going to, again, let's say, lead the FBI and say, okay, here's how we're operating. We're, we're not going to be, you know, kicking in the door of, of, of some, some uh, pro-life activists in Philadelphia uh, and, and put him in handcuffs in front of his wife and children. We're going we're gonna to handle things different as, as a, just an example that come to mind. But it all starts with the people at the top, and it starts with smart people who are committed to the Constitution and um, them getting in there and whether it's it, it, what they've done in business, identifying key people who they can trust who are going to do the right thing. I think it's all about leadership. And of course, that starts with President Trump as commander in chief and, and head of the executive branch and then right on down through each of these agencies. How different is the approach on the second term? Because in my mind, I'm thinking strategy. Yeah, First term, you're not going to do everything. Because you kind of will do 60% of what you want to do, but you got to keep some of the real stuff that you want to do on your second term to get reelected so you're not a one-term president because that's embarrassing. You want to be a two-term. So maybe you'll keep the 40 and surprise everybody on the second term because you don't give a shit about getting reelected, right? Okay. So how different is it now, second term, not back-to-back, -back, if he wins, how different is a second term being used on, on a few different lenses that I'm, I'm looking at this? One... If I'm mainstream media, uh, Trump gets elected, I don't know if Trump is my enemy anymore. I think the number one enemy for me will be who's going to be constant, which is probably going to be Elon. And I think the number two enemy for me will be J.D. Vance because he can be a two-term president. So I think Trump actually drops to three long-term, one short-term, but he goes to three long-term because Vance is actually formidable enough that he can go up toe-to-toe -to -toe against anybody, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. So now, it, are we, what, what different kind of a Trump are, gonna, are we going to see in the second term that we didn't see on the first term? Well, I think he even admitted this in his, in the, his recent uh, interview with uh, our, our conversation with, Mr. with Joe Rogan, that you know, one of the things, uh, I think Rogan asked him, what he, did he, any regrets, and he said some of the people he hired in, in the first term. And I, and I know he regrets, you know, Jeff Sessions and, and, and stuff that he did at the Justice Department. Um, so I think he will come in in a much better way. And like, he's already thinking about, I, I assume, and his team is, and Lutnick is doing the, the transition, uh, getting ready if and, if and when President Trump wins, which again, I, I think he's going to, uh, putting together that team is going to be in ready to go. The other thing is, this is why it's important we win the Senate and, and maintain the majority in the House, is I think the, I think the, the mandate is clear if we win everything. Reauthorize the tax cuts, get this economy going, uh, I mean, stop and think about it. Democrats win. They're talking about taxing unrealized gains. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. 
So we win. We, we reauthorize the tax cuts, put the tax package in place, secure the border. A lot of that President Trump can do, executive order, dealing with Mexico, getting back to remain in Mexico, working with the Mexican government. Uh, on a, And then co- common sense energy policy. I mean, energy is the key. I always, I always say if you want to, the world is safer and better when America leads. If you want to lead militarily, diplomatically, you have to lead economically. You want to lead economically, you got to have readily available energy at affordable cost. Get back to common sense energy policy. And then continue the work on this, stopping these agencies from being weaponized against, against the country. I think it's, that's the mandate. So come in, pick the people who are totally in agreement with one, two, three, and, and protecting liberty and First Amendment, all the things that, that, that we've, we've talked about, and then put them in place and let's go. So that's how it has to work. And I think the team, the transition team with Linda McMahon, Lutnig, Eric, and Don Jr. And all are, are working on putting that together. So if, in fact, next Tuesday goes like I think it's going to go, like I think we think it's going to go, um, hit the ground running. And, and get, you know, like, like President Trump, get America... Make America great. How, di- how different do you approach second versus first? You've been around nine. 94 when he became president, when he became, uh, when he went into this business, I think Clinton was president, right? First term. He well, I was in, that. yeah, I was in state, that, but in state government, but yeah, right, I came to Congress government. in six the last two years of Bush, Bush administration. Last two years of Bush. Then I had okay. all of Obama and then. So, so how, you, you, and you're a guy that studies history, you're the guy that studies this business, you're super competitive. How is second term typically treated differently than first? Yeah, I think in a, in a, in a broad context, legacy. You know, I think President Trump already has a great legacy. He, you know, he put the embassy in Jerusalem. He got out of the Iran deal. He, he uh, built a wall. He re- cut regulations. He, he did the big tax cut package. He put conservatives, three of them, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Coney Barrett on the court, changed the federal court system in a good way, lower judges as well. So I think he's already got a pretty, I, I tell people, best president in my lifetime. Uh, as far as doing what he said he was going to do, certainly. And I think now it's, it's legacy. Can he, can he do better in the Middle East and build on the Abraham Accords? Can he get our economy roaring again? Can he get back to common sense energy policy where, we're at, where as he says, we're no longer just energy independent, we're energy dominant? Um, all those things, I think, is what he's focused on. Okay. You're going to think I'm crazy when I tell you this, but the last 13 and a half years, I've been working on my first fiction book to write ever. Fiction book to write. And while I finished this book, a year ago, I got the strangest phone call about one of the characters in the book where the guy wanted to meet with me and he read the book. And afterwards, it's like, wait a minute, am I the villain in the book? This is a story about a character named Asher, who is half Armenian, half Assyrian, whose father was involved in the Iranian revolution, linked to Savak, working with the Shah, that they escape and he gets recruited to a secret society. Well, when you go to the secret society, it's been around for a couple thousand years. They've developed some of the craziest leaders of all time. And they test you. There's unique tests that they have at the society where they test to see your emotional mental toughness. One of the tests that they have is very rigorous. It's purely mental. Of course, there's a physical one, but one is mental and emotional. If you're Armenian, if you're Syrian, if you're Persian, this is a book uh, you're going to be reading and saying, holy moly, this is the kind of stuff you talk about in here? Yes. If you're somebody that's fascinated by history, this is a book for you. Characters. There's a technology that this society, secret society, builds where you go into a vault. I won't spoil it for you. When you go down, they have a technology where you get to sit down and watch and have a three, four hour conversation with Tupac. You can set up a debate between Karl Marx And Ayn Rand, Karl Marx is in the book, who wrote Communist Manifesto. Ayn Rand, who wrote Atlas Shrugged, is in the book. Marilyn Monroe explains the concept of seduction and sex in the book. When you read the book, it's about development of the next leaders in the world and how they do it and how they've been doing it for many years. And it's also about how to prevent the end of civilization and how this organization goes about doing it. So, I've never written a parenting book before, but if I ever wrote a parenting book, this is the closest thing to it because it's all mindset, a lot of crazy stories. Again, 13 and a half years, trust me, I told myself, I will not publish this book until I sell my insurance company and I'm fully disconnected from it, where it's no longer my responsibility 100%. When you read this, if you're a, cre- if you're a creative person, if you like fiction books, if you enjoyed Atlas Shrugged, or if you enjoy Divergent, if you like books like that, I think you can enjoy reading this book. It's the creative side. Business books is very easy. Here's how you do it. Here's how this how it works. This is very creative. If you haven't placed the order yet, now you can order it on Simon & Schuster, Amazon, 
I'm going to put the link up below somewhere here, maybe even in my uh, profile. Go to the book and read it. I sincerely, I've never written a book where I can't wait to read your reviews to, to see what you think about this book. So I'm going on this wild journey and we have some plans with this book here. Uh, if you support the things that I work on, I would appreciate you going to reading the book, order the book on Amazon and then post a review. If you enjoy this video, you want to watch more videos like this, click here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click here.